Earhart uh, has been working with our numismatic collection. And he told us when he spoke here a few years ago about his experiences investigating the history of money and being the son of a banker. But this is actually an access database he has created of 2,305 items that are in our collection, including the Schaefer uh, currency collection. And he has carefully housed these in archival materials. He went out and raised the money to buy those materials. He's added so much historical information and documentation to these materials that he's increased their value. I might have mentioned earlier that there was just a miscellaneous group of coins inside the safe. And he was able to identify that one of them was actually a Mormon gold coin with a monetary value of $10,000. Now, mostly we're interested in the historical value of these things. But now we have a very complete record that we actually never had before of one of the richest parts of our collections. In that process, he also went through an old accession book. And although we had converted that old crusty volume into a database, no one had really paid attention to the handwriting. He went back and verified the names of the individuals, went down in the library to prove they really were people who donated these things. And you might ask, well, how does this matter? Well, we actually a few years ago had a visit from a Lakota Sioux who found a card catalog that says something about a scalp lock for an Indian. And literally up in the drawer was a piece of hair wrap that had been taken from a Native American. That is now being repatriated back to the tribe. And Mr. Earhart went back through the accession book and found out it was donated by a man named Henry N. Berry, who served out in the 6th Iowa Cavalry under General Sully out in the Dakotas. And he helped us lock down the evidence for that, for that particular artifact that's now going to go on to find a new home. So all of this work that we do here is teamwork. It involves volunteers, it involves researchers, it involves people outside this building. So I just want to sing the praises of Mr. Earhart before he even begins to tell us about the Osage bank robbery. Uh, Mr. Earhart is actually a retired radiologist. He has his PhD um, in physics, I believe. He's a recognized authority on the history of money and author of a book called Iowa National Bank Notes and several articles about Iowa-related numismatic items. He's researched this Osage bank robbery for many years, gathering original sources from several states. And he recently worked with McCrone Associates, a Chicago high-tech laboratory, to perform a CSI analysis of the stolen currency. So here we have science being, being applied to something historic, and I think we're going to see some interesting results. Join me in welcoming Mr. Earhart. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mary, and, I, and I'd like to thank you and Charles for all of your, your help uh, preparing for this talk and over the years. Um, and at the end of the talk, I'm going to acknowledge a number of other people that have helped as well. But we'll get started. Um, you know, 10 years ago or so, I, I acquired this raggedy, dirty, old $5 bill. And uh, um, currency, I found out that various currency experts knew that this kind of bill from the Osage National Bank, uh, something unusual had happened to it. And that there were several stories going around and nobody seemed to be quite sure what exactly had happened to it. And so I got into it and I started, well, started digging to see if I could figure out what happened to it. This kind of currency is a, was created during the Civil War. It's a national, it's a U.S. official currency. It says national currency, United States of America up here, and treasury signatures here. But it says Osage National Bank uh, from Os Osage, Iowa. And down here you can't see it, that there are spaces. The cashier, Jacob H. Brush, is supposed to sign the note. And the president of the bank, Arid Hitchcock, is supposed to sign the note. And, and the notes did not become legal until the local bankers signed it also. Well, we'll find out they didn't really sign this one. But so, so I, I went down to my bank and got out of my bank box uh, this note. This was a note that was stolen in the bank robbery. And you'll have a chance to look at it. And, uh, Got another note that was stolen in the bank robbery, and they're in awful condition. Um, 
but but you can you 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 can look at them. And when we're done, I'm going to take them back and put them in my bank box. So, <laughs> um, okay. Um, so my talk will be. I'll tell you a little bit about the early days in Osage, and there may be a few people in the audience here that know more about that than I do. And we'll talk about the robbery and the thieves who were associated with this, uh, the infamous Loomis gang out of New York State. And we'll go into quite detail with that. And then kind of afterwards, what happened to people in Osage or what happened to the gang members and so forth. And finally, um, we'll talk about my my CSI lab experience uh, investigating uh, these two stolen bills to see what the, what the modern CSI lab can find out for us. And maybe they can get some DNA or something off of that. I don't know. Um, OK, Osage. When I, I guess before I started all this, I kind of thought of Iowa in the 1850s and 1860s as a reasonably well-settled, civilized place. And that may have been true along the Mississippi River and in Iowa City and Des Moines. But northern Iowa and uh, western Iowa was settled a lot later. And in fact, the first uh, settlers didn't get up into Osage until about 1853. It was uh, some prime real estate. And, and so like 55 to 57, lots of uh, settlers came. Um, a, in, in all of these areas across the country, when new land was opened up for sale by the government, land speculation, buying and selling of all of this land was a big business. Uh, spring of 1857, for example, I saw one reference that there had been over a million dollars worth of land sales in Mitchell County uh, during that time. This was from a, uh, an 1864 Iowa map that's here at the Historical Society. Here's Mitchell County. Um, let's see, what is my, uh, and there is, uh, Osa uh, here's the Cedar River coming up here. Osage is um, here. Mitchell, town of Mitchell is closer to the river. Uh, St. Ansgar, Riceville, let's see, Stacyville. Uh, I'm having a hard time reading this myself. Um, Charles City is, is down here in Floyd County. Mason City is over here. Minnesota is up here, right against the Minnesota border, for those people that are not familiar with northern Iowa. But there's not a lot else. There's this railroad put on the map, and I don't know if that really existed or if that was a gleam in somebody's eye. I don't know. Uh, um, Jamie, do you know what the, anything about what this railroad is likely to be. I, I, I kind of doubt that it was there at that time. The map makers uh, tended to be promoters. The early days of Osage in 1856 looked like this. This was compliments of the Mitchell County Historical Society. You'll notice there are not many trees here. Mitchell County, uh, uh, Osage was, was on the edge of the prairie where there weren't many trees. They were two or three miles from the Cedar River, and there were a lot of timber along the river. And so they were able to get uh, logs from the nearby, from the nearby timber, but um, not a lot of scenic trees in 56. It kind of reminds me of pictures you'd see of, of boom towns out west. You know, Can you imagine this being a town out in Wyoming or along the the railroad or something uh, being built out there, and uh, pr pretty basic town. But by um, 1880s, Osage had grown, was uh, uh, very respectable. This may be from the Paul Jewell collection of stereographs. I don't remember, if, or if this was a separate, is it? Yeah, OK. Um, I think this, this may be the uh, Cedar Valley Seminary building back here. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a more respectable, by this time, it's a more respectable building. <coughs> In any newly settled area, there always was a battle for who was going to be the county seat. And 
Osage and Mitchell were reasonably well located in a county, and so there was a big rivalry between the two. Who was going to get the county seat? The Mitch newspaper in Mitchell, I found this quote, for morality and temperance, Osage is not much noted. It is a fast town in many prospects. So that tells you what their neighbors thought of them. <laughs> and the rivalry was such that in the 1850s, both towns built courthouses, county courthouses. Um, somehow Mitchell got the upper hand early on, and all the county business was done in Mitchell. And that left the Osk County Courthouse in Osage vacant at the time. Not until, not until 19, 1870, this went to, finally went to the Iowa Supreme Court, and the Iowa Supreme Court uh, settled on Osage. And so ever since then, Osage has been the official county seat. And this, up until a week or two ago, I thought was the um, present courthouse. This is an early picture. There's a wood boardwalk out here. I don't know if this is around 1900, 1910. I don't know what the date on this picture is. Um, and this was a picture that, that Pam and I took uh, a few years ago when we visited Osage. But unfortunately, I understand that last year, this fine old 1858 courthouse was torn down and they're building a new courthouse. So it's probably good for people that are working in the new courthouse, but not so good for the rest of us. The other major institution in Osage was the Cedar Valley Seminary. And this was a, a by the time 1863 had come around, you know, Osage was prosperous enough that the good citizens decided they needed a place of higher education. And they founded the Cedar Valley Seminary. This wasn't a religious seminary. It was, it was an educational place, kind of a cross between a high school and college um, area. And again, they started this new school. They didn't have a place to use. Now we've got an empty courthouse right there. So they used the court, empty courthouse as their headquarters for the seminary. And finally, in 1869, they got this new building built and moved there. Um, the seminary f lasted until 1922. I'm not sure what it was between 22 and 1966 when the Mitchell County Historical Society took over. And now I understand that, that this building also is um, threatened with demolition. This is an early uh, graphic of Osage but this is the, the Mitchell County Seminary right there as, as a prominent feature of the place. Well, I want to introduce some of the characters in our drama. Jacob H. Brush was the first uh, person on the list. He, he was a private banker. In these early days, banks weren't like they were now. Anybody could set up a bank in their home or an office and start lending out money. Most of the time, this banking was for, uh, in, in Iowa at least, was uh, loaning on land purchases. And so he started out in Dubuque, near the federal land office in Dubuque. The land office, most of the land uh, was sold by then. It, it shortly moved to Decorah, where more federal land was being sold. And finally um, moved to Osage, when the federal land office moved to Osage and, and was selling land there. Eventually, a couple of years later, the land office moved to Des Moines. But Jacob A. Brush, H. Brush stayed in um, Osage and continued banking. And in, in 1866, he was one of the co-founders of our Osage National Bank. When I was looking up at the courthouse, looking through the old land records in the courthouse for, for something else, but I noticed, I couldn't help but notice, that uh, Jacob Brush was probably the, the most active purchaser and seller of land. He was a, quite a speculator. He was a dealer in land. A um, couple of years ago, as I was looking through some of the old correspondence in the Historical Society here, I ran across a letter from Jacob Brush. Here's his signature, uh, J.H. Brush 
from in, at this time in, in 1859, August 21st, 1859, he had his own bank, what he called the Mitchell County Bank, and he was a banker, dealer in exchange, and real estate broker. And so he was buying and selling real estate and, uh, and loaning money to people that wanted to do the same. Th this letter was about, uh, he was the, the uh, founders of the Historical Society were uh, very insightful. They were trying to collect newspapers, all the newspapers from all the different, news, I mean, all the issues of all the different newspapers published in the state. And this was a letter from uh, Brush, who at that time owned the North Iowa newspaper saying that, okay, here is enclosed a copy of our latest issue of the, of the newspaper. Another player was Arid Hitchcock. He arrived a year or two later, but very shortly became prominent in the community. And in uh, the next year, he was elected county judge. And at that time, there was no county board of supervisors. The county judge really had all the powers to act from the things that the county board of supervisors does now. He made the decisions about things affecting the county. He, he was a prominent merchant involved in a lot of things. Uh, the first grain dealer in town, he owned the Hitchcock House Hotel, and uh, later became a co-founder of, of our bank. And finally, uh, was elected state senator. Unfortunately, the year after he was elected state senator, he died and didn't, wasn't able to serve uh, in, in, the, uh, in that office for very long. Uh, here is uh, one of my favorite gentlemen, Squire McKinley, another early Osage uh, resident. His father had brought the family to Mitchell County in 1855, just a couple of years after the first settlers got there. Uh, he was born, I think, in 1840, so in 1861, he was prime military age. And one of the county histories said that he was the first Mitchell County volunteer to sign up for the 3rd Iowa Infantry Regiment during the Civil War. Um, the 3rd Iowa Regiment fought under Sherman and Grant at Shiloh and Vicksburg and other battles and finally fought itself out of existence at the Battle of Atlanta. And uh, the, with less than having less than half of its uh, uh, original members still functioning. Uh, Squire McKinley was fortunate, was never wounded, and he, he, he was started out as a private, ended up as a sergeant. Um, he came back to Osage in 64. He tried to organize another company of men for the war, but by the time he got that done, the war was winding down and they didn't need him. So, he's, so he didn't have to go back into the army. But so then in 65, he decided, I'm going to run for sheriff. And he won a close race. There were 729 voters in Mitchell County that year. And he won by a margin of 27 votes. Well, well one of the local papers describing his election and him, and they said, uh, he has a particular antipathy to horse thieves. You know? And horse, thief, horse theft was important business because that was the only means of transportation. And if you, didn't, if you lost your horses, you, were, you had trouble. Another person we're going to hear a lot about. In August, I think, of 65, after the war, this guy from New York comes to town, Ezra Beebe. Actually, he came to uh, Mitchell, not to Osage. And he bought the National Hotel in Mitchell. And he uh, put this ad in the Mitchell newspaper. It says, National Hotel, Ezra Beebe proprietor, Mitchell County, Mitchell, Mitchell County, Iowa having purchased the above well-known house, would be happy to welcome the traveling public at the National Hotel. We will endeavor to make all of our friends feel at home while sojourning with us. Sounds like a good place to be. Well, now we're after the war. You know, all the veterans are coming home from the, from the war. Things are gonna get better. People are optimistic. It must have been a good time to be in Osage and most other places in the north. To top that off, the word was out the railroad was coming to town. And that's going to bring booms. Well, the railroad didn't get there 
till three years later, 1869, but at least it was on its way. And so things are looking good. We need a bank. We need a real bank, a solid bank. And the federal government during the Civil War had established this new kind of banks, national banks, like the first national bank of Iowa City. Uh, and so, and that was, that was a very successful, one of the success, most successful things the government did during the war were these national banks. So the good citizens of Osage got together and said, let's form a national bank. And I think in September of 65, um, a number of them formed a company to do so, sent in an application to the government, and in uh, December of 65, the government um, approved their application uh, to create the Osage National Bank. The president of the bank would be Arid Hitchcock. The in those days, the president of the bank would be the money man, probably the man that bought the most shares in the bank, and, and uh, um, but uh, did not take an active hand in the banking. The cashier of the bank, or Jacob Brush, he was the guy, he was the, really the experienced banker. He managed all the day-to-day -day business. If you wanted a loan, you better talk with Jacob Brush. Banks then were not for putting your savings in. Uh, if the bank went bust, well, what happened to your savings? But banks were more for loaning money. Well, if you have a new bank, where are you going to house it? You need a safe building, you know, that something that commands uh, respect from people. You need a good, solid bank building. There were empty space in town. The county courthouse was still empty. The Cedar Valley Seminary occupied part of it, but other parts were empty. Particularly, the treasurer's office in the courthouse was empty. And so Hitchcock and Brush arranged that the bank was going to be housed in the empty treasurer's office in the county courthouse. Well, I'm going to, um, anyway, the key thing here is that, um, that the bankers, the, the treasury would print the currency and send it to the bank. And then the local bankers, the cashier and the president, had to sign it before it became legal. If the bankers did not sign the notes, it was not legal and, and worthless. Well, in early February of 66, things were progressing on a rapid front with the new bank. The local paper, the North Iowan, carried this ad in February 1st. I don't know if you can read it. It says, Mr. Brush returned from the East last week and although not able to get the bills of our bank so as to bring them with him, still made arrangements by which they will be here soon. Exclamation point. The bank commenced business on February 1st, and it's now doing everything except discounting paper. And then two weeks later, it was a weekly paper, the paper carried this other note, that said, the first installment of $10,000 worth of the notes of this institution arrived this present week have been signed by the officers and are many of them in circulation. The second batch of a like amount is on the way. Another $10,000 was on its way shortly. We must congratulate the president, A. Hitchcock, Esquire, on his signed Emmanuel <coughs> attached to these notes. Every signature is unmistakably <coughs> Arid Hitchcock and not the abbreviation or hieroglyphics which usually represent his name. <laughs> So he took a little more care with putting his, putting his signature on official money. Here is where the bank did its business. This is the Mitchell County Courthouse again. And you'll note, um, well, on, on the lower left corner, the window there, that's where the treasurer's office was. On the side right there connected to it is the treasurer's vault, two and a half foot thick brick walls. Um, with, a, with a wrought iron door uh, uh, sealing it off. This door, I don't know when, I wish I could find out when this door was put in, and this is not the original door, but um, I, I don't know when, but it was probably looked like that except more crude. And you had to get through this, uh, this iron door to get inside the vault. 
Inside the vault was Lilly's patent safe. This is an ad from an Iowa City paper by an agent advertising he was selling Lilly's uh, celebrated impenetrable bank safes, vault doors and locks. So this was, this was a vault door and, and locks and in an impenetrable safe. Well, that wasn't quite right. This is again in the uh, uh, treasurer's office from a few years ago. The vault door is now open and you can see inside a lot of papers and documents and other things. But this is where Lily's safe was stored by the um, Osage National Bank. The newspaper carried a comment to us that the bank officers felt that this arrangement was so safe that they didn't need to have anyone sleep in the bank. <laughs> and I guess that must have been a common practice that you had somebody sleep in the bank to protect everything. Well, May 5th, Saturday night. Um, well, the next morning, Sunday morning, one of the assistant cashiers comes into the bank to do a little business and discovers havoc. The vault door has been forced open and the, the safe has been, the door of the safe has been blown off with gunpowder and everything taken out of the safe. The newspaper reported this as the Osage National Bank entered by burglars, the vault broken open, the safe blown up with gunpowder, $20,000 stolen. Last Saturday night, our village was the scene of a robbery, which for boldness and success has few equals in the annals of crime. <laughs> so crime in Osage anyway. But $20,000 was an awful lot of money at that time. That would buy a lot of farms. Um, as another part of the article, the bankers had one thing going for them. They had made a record of a lot of the serial numbers in the, in the safe. And so they published lists of serial numbers that were stolen. And um, right here is $9,000 in unsigned $5 bills to this bank in sheets uh, numbered from 1751 to 2200. And, and that's how I can tell you that this was stolen out of that safe. Because this one has serial number, like this one has serial number 1860, right in this range, 1751 to 20. Uh, 2,200. Well, so what happened? I mean, the, the robbers came in. They forced the vault door open somehow. They tried to force the uh, safe door open. They couldn't do it, but they were experienced bank robbers. They knew you just drill a hole in the door. They drilled through one and a half inches of iron get some, pour some gunpowder in there and light it off. The door is blowing off the safe. You go in and you clean out the safe and you make your exit. One kind of remarkable thing, they, you know, the, the sheriff was talking to people the next day and he, there was a guy living upstairs in the courthouse on the opposite corner of the courthouse. He was probably with the seminary. And the guy says, you know, last night I heard this commotion, this pounding and this explosion and everything. He says, but I just thought it was some of the young bucks, you know, having some mischievous fun. <laughs> and uh, so, um, but uh, so they didn't, didn't, they lost an opportunity to catch the, catch the thieves then. Anyway, um, so there were $9,000 worth of these $5 bills stolen. There were $11,000 worth of other types of currency stolen. These compound interest and interest bearing notes are very scarce notes today. Very few of those have ever survived, including a $1,000 note and four or $500 notes. Some Mitchell County warrants, some revenue stamps, and some gold pens. And for a long time, I didn't pay any attention to these gold pens. I just thought, of, well, this is maybe a gold uh, fountain pen like Parker Brothers or Schaefer or something, but then I finally, well, in 1866, they didn't have fountain pens. And I, I found this image on the internet of a gold pen. Sometimes they just had gold nibs, sometimes, or in uh, fancy holders, not just a plain wooden holder, but maybe a gold or, or other ivory or some else, other fancy thing. One thing, this thousand dollar bill is completely unknown, looking up the most authoritative references about 
what currency the United States Treasury issued, they just say, these, this thousand dollar bill was probably issued. They don't know, they know, but they don't have any records that it ever was issued. But we've got a serial number of one that was in the bank. So we've got information that in fact they were issued. If you could find this, where the robbers hid their, these notes were not recovered. If you could find where they were uh, hidden, that thousand dollar bill is probably worth more than a million dollars today. So all you treasure hunters, get up to Osage and to Mitchell and start digging around. Because we had these serial numbers, they were well publicized in the, all, the Iowa, all the Iowa papers and nationally. This is a broadside from 1876 uh, listing counterfeit notes, but you can't read it from here, but down uh, here in the, under $5 notes, there's Osage National Bank listed with an asterisk saying that they were stolen notes. So all responsible bankers or big time money people should have known that those notes were stolen. But some people ignored the information. This is a different note. Well, I don't know if you can, how well you can see it, but there are, it's another $5 note from Osage but there are these blue S's stamped all over it. And some banker had accepted this note as a good bill and sent it in to be redeemed. It was worn out, sent it in to be redeemed. And some treasury official caught it. And they were on the ball, they knew it was no good, and sent it back to the bank with this note. It says, this note is rejected because it was stolen when unsigned and is therefore worthless to signatures being forged. And this one has nice arid Hitchcock, you can read that, and J Jacob Brush here, but, but it's, it's worthless. I, I, I wish I had this note and the, and the thing there. Anyway, who did it? A couple days after the, uh, the robbery, the sheriff from Decorah uh, brings a couple of men to Osage, that these guys must have done it. Unfortunately, they had an alibi. They had to let them go. Well, Sheriff McKinley had his eye. There was two suspicious characters living over in Ezra Beebe's hotel in Mitchell. And these guys you know, had no visible means of support. Occasionally, they would disappear for several days and come back seemingly flush with money. So there's something funny going on. So the first thing the sheriff does, he goes over to Mitchell and talks to Ezra Beebe. He was trying to find out information about his lodgers. Well, B.B. was so evasive, he wouldn't give him any real information. So the sheriff started getting suspicious of Ezra too. And there's something funny about this whole group of people over there. But he couldn't, he had no evidence, what could he do? Three weeks later, two lawmen from New York State arrive in town and get together with uh, McKinley. These were a deputy sheriff from Madison County and Constable James Filkins from one of the towns there. And he tells the sheriff, I've got arrest warrants for those guys over in the Mitchell Hotel. The names you've been using are just aliases. Their real names are Laverne Beebe, Ezra's son, and Thomas Mott, Ezra's son-in-law. And not only that, these guys are well-known hardened criminals they're members of the Loomis gang. McKinley says, who's that? Well, we'll learn more about them. Uh, McKinley says, we can't arrest them. He says, I haven't got any evidence. And Philkin says, you've got to arrest them. I've got a valid warrant. And if they find out I'm in town, they're gone and we'll never see them again. I've been pursuing them for years. And I'm not going to let them get away this time. So they're arrested. Ezra and Laverne Beebe and Thomas Mott. Their lodgings were searched, some currency was found, the revenue stamps and gold pens were found. It's clear that they were the guilty party. The wives, one of the wives had carrying a roll of currency from the bank that was covered in a white powder and uh, the, the newspaper called Plaster of Paris. And the safes of those days, the walls of the safes were lined with some kind of a powder to act as a fireproof material um, and typically plaster of Paris, talc, or some other materials, kind of a proprietary 
product. But anyway, so the wives were also charged. Filkin says, I gotta get these guys to New York. We're not gonna hang around here and wait for your trial. So he's taking them. So four days later, he's gone. He rides out of town 1 a.m. in the night to you know, not let anybody block him. Well now, so he's taking them back to New York for trial. So let's talk about, oh, oh well, I should, he's taking them back to New York. He didn't quite get there well successfully. They, he, you know, he rode, I don't know where he caught the train, maybe in Dubuque or Prairie Sheen or maybe someplace in Iowa. They eventually got a train and started heading back east. They got near Erie, Pennsylvania, and Laverne Beebe and Thomas Mott said, we gotta go to the bathroom. So Philkin says, okay, you know, go down the end of the car there, there's a, there's a place. So they go in the, in the restroom there, and Laverne Beebe immediately jumps out the window. And Thomas Mott tries to jump out the window, but the car must have lurched or something or other. And he banged his head on the sill and almost knocked himself unconscious, so he didn't get away. But Laverne Beebe got away and was never seen in Iowa or New York again. Mott and Ezra Beebe were taken back to New York. The gang, I'm gonna to have to speed up here telling, I've got to, I could talk all afternoon telling you stories, but I won't do it. The gang, you know, started out by George Washington Loomis, was run out, chased out of Vermont by a posse for horse stealing early on. He ended up in Sangerfield, New York, um, where some relatives of his had lived. He married a, youngest, uh, a young, good-looking lady who also had the advantage that um, her father was into counterfeiting also, so she, she was not a, so. But she, Rhoda, turned out to be a very forceful character. She turned out to be the matriarch of the game. They had a big family, um, I think six boys and four girls evidently grew to adulthood, but she taught those kids to be criminals, went out and deliberately did it. She told them, if you're going to town, don't come back until you've stolen something. <laughs> And they did. Well, there was just something small to start with, and as they got older, they, um, you know, th th their sights were raised. And for those of you, I don't know how many people are familiar with New York, but this is the uh, uh, area of this map. Um, here's Cooperstown, New York, down in this corner. Um, Syracuse, New York, is over here. Utica is here. This is the general area that they were in. Uh, the Loomis Farm. Is right, is right here in the center of this area. My great-great-grandfather lived just a little bit uh, south of Cooperstown, and he got out of there in 1840 and took the Erie Canal to, uh, to, Wisconsin, well, to the lakes and then to Wisconsin. But I always wondered if uh, maybe the, the Loomis gang stole some of their horses or livestock or burned their barn or something or other, and he said, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> and that's what drove him to, to immigrate. Nine Mile Swamp was right, went right along here. And this was handy because it really was a big swamp. I think it's still there. But the Loomises, they had a big house, big barn, lots of hiding places in each. But the ultimate hiding place, if people were hot on the trail of things, was to take it into the Nine Mile Swamp. And if you could hide it, get it in there, nobody would ever find it. Oh, well, this poster, um, this is a, a fantasy piece produced by the Cooper's, by the uh, Farmers Museum in Cooperstown. And, and I bought it over the internet just so I could show that I, I, I wasn't the only guy that was interested in the Loomis Gang. Mm -hmm. If you look up on the internet, you'll see, oh, there have been six or seven books published about them, a couple of full-length videos and numerous articles. Um, and, and so that was nice. But then I was especially pleased when I read the text, because it says, assisted by members of the gang, including Plum Loomis, Ezra Beebe, and Thomas Mott. They were key members of the gang. And the museum in Cooperstown knew it. Everybody knew it. As the kids matured and grew up, their crimes got worse, and um, worse and worse, and they attracted more people to their criminal activities, and the, the gang grew and grew. 
specialties were horse theft and counterfeiting, but everything they did, I mean, indulged in all manners of crime, you name it, they did it. But they were rather immune to uh, conviction. They cultivated a lot of connections in the political system, in the judicial system, and managed to avoid, they got indicted a lot, but managed to avoid convictions. Um, Really, all legal and illegal means. They believed in hiring the best lawyers. If they, if they couldn't get out of something by legal means, they would use illegal means. One time, the DA was walking, one night, the DA was walking across the street carrying some incriminating documents against one of the gang members. He was mugged and the documents stolen. Another time, the courthouse, some incriminating documents and the indictments were in the courthouse. Well, all of a sudden, one night, the courthouse caught fire. They called out the fire brigade, the pumper wagon pulls up. A couple of the Loomises show up also. They want to help put out the fire. Pull out the hoses from the pumper. The hoses have been cut. No way that you could, and so the courthouse burned down and burned up all of the evidence. At this time, so the Loomises got off for that event. Ezra Beebe was one of the other people named that was had evidenced against him, and the head of the Loomises charged Beebe $100 for the service of destroying the evidence against him. I tried contacting a lot of people out east, a lot of institutions, for portraits of any of the Loomises. They were smart crooks, and they didn't let their portraits be known. I find the only thing I could find was from the Fenimore Art Museum in Cooperstown. They had this portrait of a young lady um, that all they knew was that she was somehow associated with the Loomis gang. And I don't know if she was a, a wife or a mistress or a daughter. I don't know, somebody, an expert in dating old paintings maybe could give us more information about that. This had been going on and the counties around uh, there were just completely overrun with crime. Finally, something happened. In 1858, James Filkins, our guy, was elected constable. He was a blacksmith, and he got elected himself elected constable of one of the nearby villages. He pursued, for some reason, he had a grudge against the Loomises, and he pursued them and pursued them and pursued them, and get lots of indictments, but practically never any convictions. Well, he pursued them to the point, he was such a pest and such a nuisance, then in 1862, one day he was in his home. There was some, uh, some men outside hollered for him, so he came to the window and shotgun blasts, peppered his house, wounded uh, uh, Filkins several times, and then ran away. Who was the suspects? Our good friends Ezra and Laverne Beebe. But nothing. Um, Nothing ever happened. No convictions were ever made. Well, in 64, late in the Civil War, you know, all these returning veterans that had used up their time, they're used to taking matters into their own hands. And so we've got to organize a vigilante group to get rid of these guys. So they decided one Saturday night, everybody get together up above somebody's store and we'll charge a dollar dues and we'll organize a vigilante committee. Well, they were in the middle of their meeting in walks a couple of the Loomises and says they want to join the committee and put down their dollar each. Well, that was the end of that vigilante group. But Filkins didn't give up. The next year, he led another mob out to the Loomis farm. And during the, during the raid, uh, the Loomis leader was beaten to death. Another of the Loomises was burned very badly. And then the, the, the Filkins and group retired. Well, the Loomises then uh, brought legal action against Filkins. He was indicted for murder. And that dragged on in the courts. Well, then in 1866, we're getting up to the present here now. Nearby, there was an old lady murdered during a robbery. And, uh, um, and Filkins thought that the Beebe's and Mott were the crooks. Somehow, and I wish I knew this, but somehow Filkins learned that Beebe's and Mott were in Iowa. So what is he, I'm gonna get him. So he goes to the governor of New York, Governor Fenton, and he says, I want a warrant 
to go to Iowa and get these crooks, these murderers. Well, the governor likes to, like to get rid of the murderers, but he had a problem. He said, Philkins, I can't send you to New York. You're under indictment for murder. <laughs> and well, so they talked about it. They came up with a compromise. The, um, there was a young deputy sheriff had been appointed recently in that county, uh, Deputy Sheriff Asa Stone. And the governor said, I'll give the warrant to that, to that young deputy sheriff. And you go with him, and you make sure that you bring uh, these crooks back. So he did that, and he got to Iowa just after the robbery. And I don't think, I think this all must have happened before the robbery, and I think it must have just been a coincidence that, that he got there shortly after the robbery. So I don't know how he could get there three days after the robbery and, and you know, get the warrant and all of that. Oops. Well, when Philkins got back to home, the very day he got home, that morning, Somebody had come to his house and told his wife, there's a horse thief out at the Loomis farm and there's some stolen horses out there. So that night, Philkins arranges for a posse, goes out to Loomis farm, and another gun battle ensues. And Philkins is wounded twice more. And they retire unsuccessfully. Well, all of these gun battles were just too much. And so a week later, a larger mob was formed, uh, consisting of almost all the lawmen in Mitchell County and, and lots of other prominent citizens. And a mob goes out and attacks the Loomis farm. We're going to put these guys out of business. So they, they grab the leader of the gang and says, who shot Philkins last week? He wouldn't talk. So they took him out to one of the trees on the farm and hung him up, hanged him up. Do you hung, hanged him up or hung him up? Hanged him up. And then after a few minutes, lowered him down. Who shot Philkins? Talk now. He wouldn't talk. So they raised him up again. A few more minutes hanging there. Lowered him down. Who shot Philkins? Wouldn't talk. So they hanged him again a third time. And lowered down. This time he was near death. But who shot? And they finally told him. He finally talked. He couldn't. He figured he couldn't take a, couldn't, couldn't take a fourth time. So he told him. And then the gang went wild. They burned the farmhouse, all the buildings, um, attacked the gang, and basically told the surviving members of the gang, get out of town, get out of the county, get out of the state, you know, you're a goner if you ever show up around here again. And that was kind of the end, it wasn't immediately, but that was the, the start of the major downfall of the gang. The, um, what happened afterwards, who oh, better get going. Anyway, the bank survived and eventually built a new building. In 68, they advertised that they had gotten a new safe that was drill proof. You know, they're not gonna do it to us again. Sheriff McKinley ran for reelection, but he lost and eventually moved to um, Northwest Minnesota in Becker County and helped form the town of Osage, Minnesota. Um, the McKinleys are a longtime family in Osage or Mitchell County. They still are there. Judge Brian McKinley just retired from there, and he helped me with the, some of this, correcting some of my mistakes on, on some of this. Philkins eventually had to come to trial for his murder trial. He got the um, there was a prominent United States Senator from New York, one of the leaders of the U.S. Senate, and he got him to come to New York and defend him at the trial. And nobody wanted to convict Philkins, and they, they canceled the indictment, and he got off. The B.B. Wives were tried in Charles City. I don't, they must have asked for a change of venue. And had a hung jury, Tried once, had a hung jury. I think the vote was 11 to 1 for conviction. Local newspapers suggest, well, maybe the women used their feminine charms on the jury. It was never proven. They tried him again, hung jury again. And then I couldn't find what happened to them uh, because the newspapers weren't available. But Pam and I went to the Charles City Courthouse, looked through the old court records, and sure enough, 
in their first court book in 1866 and 67, there were the records for the BBYs uh, saying that finally at the end of 67, the case was dismissed. They gave up, the prosecution gave up, they couldn't prove it. Laverne Beebe never appeared in the East again. He beat a hasty retreat as far west as he could go. And uh, it was said to have died um, as an army scout fighting Apaches. I haven't been able to find any documentation of that, but that's supposedly what happened to him. I didn't know what happened to Ezra and Thomas Mott until very recently, and I found out that in 1870, they were up in Waseca, Minnesota, about 75 miles north of Osage, and they robbed the bank there, very similarly, blew the safe open. But there, the local residents were on the ball, and they were caught as they were trying to make their getaway um, a few couple days later. What was interesting was that the newspaper there reported that they had shipped a package. Before, um, before they were caught, they had shipped an express package to someone named Hubbard in Osage. The authorities intercepted this package, and it turned out to be a kit that had expert burglary tools. And so there must have been somebody in Osage still that they had some connection with. It'd be nice to know who that was. Well, I've got to get going. Um, anyway, so I wanted to do this CSI studies, and um, I got made contact with McCrone Associates in the Chicago area. They brought the bills into a, a clean room, class five clean room, and uh, first did an inspection with a mic optical microscope, then um, used the sticky material to take particles, loose particles, off of the bills, take that over to a, a scanning electron microscope, and would get images like this. The, there's a long fiber there. Can you? See, there are large, larger particles, which probably, which are organic material, maybe skin flakes, lots of different tinier particles. One of the most interesting ones, this five micron particle, proved to be iron oxide. But this rounded, these rounded globules that are all stuck together had to be someplace really hot to melt this iron. What better place to get it really hot than in an explosion in a safe? This was embedded in the, dollar, in the $5 bills. Um, well, we don't have time. This is an x-ray spectrum showing iron and oxygen coming out of that iron oxide particle. There are also particles of talc, which probably is that white powder that was found on some of the other bills. There was clay, a lot of clay on the uh, note, or just dirt, the notes were dirty. Um, and so, the CSI couldn't prove that uh, who did it or actually prove that it was in the, in the explosion, but at least it um, was very consistent with it having do been done so. As far as I know, nobody has ever done a CSI study on, these, on an old and antique currency like this. Well, I better, I better quit here. We're running late. Um, and I just wanted to point out some of the many individuals that uh, that have helped me with various things during all of this work. So I'll, so I'll quit there. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? Yeah. Where did you get the bills? Um, in, in auctions. So they've been hanging around the various <coughs> currency collectors and for a long time, and, and I was able to, yeah, I was able to buy them at two different auctions. Anybody else? Was the currency ever found? But did they find Most it? of it was not found. You know, maybe fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars worth were found, but the rest of it. I mean, the Lewis gang were expert at passing counterfeit money. They knew how to forge the signatures. They knew how to distress the notes, dirty them up, and don't make them look new, and pass them on to somebody that would, that would uh, you know, try to pass them. So, and they did a good job with that. So I think that $1,000 note is probably not in uh, Mitchell County. It probably, who knows where it is, but uh, I don't know. But, I, but I'd like you to go look anyway. That'd be great. <laughs>
Jim, I'm interested in your sequence of events. Yes. Did you know about the robbery in Osage before you purchased the notes? Mm -hmm. Vice versa. Um, I knew that they were stolen, but some people thought they were stolen in a bank robbery. Some people thought they were stolen in an express robbery, you know, as being shipped someplace, and maybe there was some other thing. And, and so, um, so, so I thought, well, I'll find out for sure what was really going on. Well, that's Iowa in the Wild West. <laughs> yes. So thanks for telling us about it. And I'll remind you uh, that two weeks from today, I'm sorry, two weeks from today, Marlon Ingalls from the Office of the State Archaeologist is going to talk about the brewery caves that are underneath the uh, whole block over here by Pagliai's Pizza and, and the Englert Brewery Building. And he's also going to talk about some up in Cedar Rapids that they've recently been investigating. So I hope you'll join us. We have History for Lunch running up every two weeks up through May 21st when Eric Zimmer is going to talk about the smallpox epidemic that hit the Meskwaki settlement in 1901. And I guarantee that's going to be a fascinating lecture. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Earhart. <laughs>